ladies and gentlemen, it is our great pleasure to welcome you. In this episode, we will discuss the new world order, Novas. What will the world be like in the future, and what must be done right now to save it? Your favorite Henry Keane will talk about it with the best of experts. Well, everybody knows how it goes to protect democracy, to protect the weak from the strong, to protect justice. Joe Biden addressed the nation from the Oval Office of the White House for only the second time in his three years as a president. The president's speech has been broadcasted by all the leading US TV channels. It lasted 15 minutes. Biden spoke about the war in Ukraine, the attack by Hamas militants on Israel, and why the success of both Ukraine and Israel is vitally important for the United States. Biden considers this moment to be a turning point no less. For the world, a battle between world democracies and autocracies. What is important is that in this context, the United States President first compared the Russian regime and Hamas at such a level. We're facing an inflection point in history. One of those moments where the decisions we make today are going to determine the future for decades to come. Hamas and Putin represent different threats, but they share this in common. They both want to completely annihilate a neighboring democracy, completely annihilate it. You know, history has taught us that when terrorists don't pay a price for their terror, when dictators don't pay a price for their aggression, they cause more chaos and death and more destruction. They keep going. And the cost and the threats to America and the world keep rising. So if we don't stop Putin's appetite for power and control of Ukraine, he won't limit himself just to Ukraine. And after the speech, the United States president submitted a budget request to Congress for a total of $105 billion. The largest part of that package, $61.4 billion, is a military and economic aid to Ukraine. The request also includes $10.6 billion for military support to Israel. The administration is also asking for $9 billion additional in humanitarian aid. This is a total for Ukraine, the Gaza Strip, and Israel. Biden explained, and I hope it is obvious enough for anyone who has eyes, that the actions of the United States are being watched not only by its allies, but also by opponents, maybe even closely by opponents. If America stops providing aid to Ukraine and Putin can deprive Ukraine of its independence, other potential aggressors around the world will find the courage to try to do the same. Oh, they will, if you ask me, or them. At the end of his address, Biden emphasized that America's leadership is what, I quote, holds the world together. Maybe sound like pathos, but that doesn't make it any less real. That is exactly the case. Imagine the world without the United States today. It would be a Hamas Kremlin North Korea feast, devouring, hesitating and decision impotent Europe. More to come. The very next day after the historic speech, the American leader spoke at a pre-election private fundraising reception at the White House. There, Biden said that humanity now needs a no less but a, I quote, a new world order. I think we have an opportunity to do things if we are bold enough and have enough confidence in ourselves to unite the world in ways that it never has been. We were in a post-war period for 50 years, where it worked pretty damn well, but that sort of ran out of steam, sort of ran out of steam. It needs a new, a new world order in a sense like that was a world order. Well, that was pretty damn clear, wasn't it? On October 22nd, the leader of the Republicans in the United States Senate, Mitch McConnell, during his interview to Fox News, in which he called China, Russia and Iran the new axis of evil, according to him, the states led by Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin and Ali Khamenei are forming their own new world order and are watching the reaction of the civilized world to the conflicts that break out. The leader of the minority in the Senate said that Iran is the main sponsor of the terrorism and accused China of supporting the aggressors. McConnell recalled how during his speech at the One Belt, One Road summit, the Chinese leader declared, I quote, endless friendship with Russia. And he emphasized the fact that the world is in many ways now in greater danger than at any time in its history since it is facing a great competition of forces. 
It's an emergency that we step up and deal with this axis of evil. China, Russia, Iran, because it's an immediate threat to the United States. The Prime Minister of Japan said, if you want to send President Xi a message, beat the Russians in Ukraine. The South Koreans, the Japanese, Taiwanese are all interested in what's happening over in Ukraine because they know President Xi is watching that. President Xi re uh, recently declared that they had an endless friendship with the Russians. What more do you need to know about how relevant Ukraine is to Asia and to the Middle East? Wow, Fox News. Previously, a number of Republicans criticized Joe Biden for wanting to link aid to Ukraine and Israel. However, McConnell disagreed with such a criticism. He emphasized that American aid to Ukraine is actually nothing, but America is helping itself, giving the possibility of restoring and renewing, just by the way, the United States military industrial base. After all, thanks to the aid to Ukraine, a lot of jobs are created in 38 states. The most important thing has also been said. I will quote McConnell. If the Russians aren't defeated, they'll invade a NATO country next. So both Democrats and Republicans are united in understanding that Ukraine must be helped to stop Putin. Good, finally, but will that be enough? Let's discuss it with our guest. Let us talk for more. Mr. Jason Smart, American political technologist and political scientist. What is the biggest threat to international stability these days, then, if we do, let me ask you a straightforward question? Undoubtedly, it's the alliance between Russia and Iran. Uh, between these two state actors, it's very obvious that they're sponsoring a number of non-state actors, such as Hamas, such as Hezbollah, mm. uh, which wreak havoc around the world. They also work with things like drug cartels in Latin America, and they're involved with other criminal enterprises in Asia. So this alliance is quite a dangerous one, and it presents a significant problem for not just the West, but the world entire. So, you know, the, the, the people like to tell me they, they're experts, first of all. Then they say that stability is good. But is stability good? Because, I mean, North Korea is stable. It is poor. It is a dictatorship. So any new thoughts um, um, uh, after Biden's speech? Well, maybe the, the uh, stability. What is stability? What kind of a stability do we need in a new world's order? Let me ask you that one. So there's different types of stability, but when we talk about North Korea being stable, it is relatively stable, um, but that's domestically. So that's not a problem for us. That's why there's very little interaction with North Korea. It's isolated and it's stable internally. You know, Russia, before it invaded Ukraine, was obviously already a dictatorship. It was already non-democratic. It was already a kleptocracy. That being said, you know, it was sort of left alone to do that. Nobody was really going to interfere with it because it was just, you know, too much trouble. It's really their problem, not our problem. You only start to create instability once they start to create problems for other people. And in this case, this is why Russia is, you know, the most sanctioned country in the history of the world, is specifically because it didn't just contain itself and remain internally stable with its dictatorship. Rather, it decided to try to export its fascism to other countries vis-a-vis -vis the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Let me say that the world's democracy is under the threat of terror. Is Biden using, uh, Biden is using that actually, uh, sentences like that. So is he using sort of a narrative as an element of his election campaign? Yes, I mean, most certainly democracy is something that Americans identify with. So as a campaign issue, that's something that does play well. Uh, Americans have historically uh, had a sense that their country is uh, unusually free and democratic, which is true, <laughs> uh, if we compare it to the global scale. Um, yeah, but at the same time, I think that he needs to do more to reach out to Americans to explain what it is in Ukraine. That's not simply about freedom and democracy, but it's directly the U.S.'s interest. Once Americans understand that this is something that's strategically wise for their own well-being and their security, not just the hypothetical, uh, it's much more easy to identify with. How to do that? How to convey the message, what the message should be to, to American nation? I mean, not just like, you know, politicians and political scientists, and even maybe not media, how to talk to Americans. So to make them understand that human rights should be working all across the human universe, otherwise these are not rights, this is something else. 
So I, I think that it's going to be multifold. One is that many people don't seem to realize that there's a direct correlation with the country being democratic, but also not being a threat to other countries. There's a reason that democratic countries have a tendency of not going to war, whereas authoritarian regimes do have a tendency of going to war. Uh, they don't have to worry about what their population thinks about it. Uh, countries like the United States, it's perhaps a, it, and not a criticism that it's democratic, that's a good thing, but a criticism that they say, you know, the Americans always worry about escalating the situation, escalating Moscow. Uh, and I think they do worry too much about that. But the reason is simple, is because, you know, the president ultimately has to worry about his re-election, as he has to worry about his party's election in the Congress. And so they don't want to do anything that would escalate the situation, which would be unpopular with the domestic population, where dictatorships just don't care. And that's why Putin right. is, you know, completely right. unfazed by the fact that they're losing so many soldiers in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, Mark Johnson. What is for Ukraine to expect? Well, uh, Mac is quite clear on what he believes. Uh, what he has said publicly just in the past year is that uh, he thought that there was a huge waste of money being sent to Ukraine. Uh, he thought it was a waste of time that Biden went to visit Kiev. He said that it was a poor use and that he's ignoring American needs to put the foreign needs instead in charge. Mm. Uh, he has also said there should be more investigations to where money has gone for Ukraine. And uh, generally speaking, he's been quite negative about support for Ukraine. Of the seven laws that Congress has passed, or I should say budget amendments or other finance for Ukraine or weapons for Ukraine, out of the seven that Congress has passed, he voted against six of them. Hmm. Let me return to the matter that interests me a lot. I mean, you said Russia and Iran are the axis of evil. What about China? Is China in the company? So China's playing a different role. China re recognizes that at this point, it can't afford to do anything like that. Ideologically, it definitely likes to see what's going on. I mean, definitely does support this breaking down of the world order and the instability that comes with it. Uh, that being said, China, more than half of its imports and exports come from the United States and Europe. Uh, it's simply not its economic interest where less than 2% of its economy is tied to Russia. They just financially, it's just impossible at this point to do something serious to ally with, with uh, Russia or Iran. That being said, they are certainly looking at the situation of what is occurring with Ukraine, what is occurring in the Middle East, uh, specifically for the U.S.'s reaction. And based upon that, if they think the U.S. is weak or the U.S. won't respond, uh, then we have a different situation, which is China might very well try to take Taiwan. Yeah, no, no response is a response, isn't it? Exactly right. Exactly. So we have to be cautious of the fact that China is watching this, observing this carefully, right. and is waiting to make its move as well. Middle East, Israeli ground operation in Gaza Strip. Could that ignite a global fire? Most certainly. I mean, we are at the verge of some very complicated things. We know that uh, Iranian-backed militants have been engaged in a number of different attacks so in Yemen, obviously within Palestine itself against Israel. Mm. Uh, we see it from Lebanon as well. We see it throughout the region. I mean, Iran is definitely stepping up the degree that's engaging in international terrorism in multiple countries in the Middle East. But it's not just limited there. It's important to note that uh, Iran has for years been trading with things like drug cartels in Latin America. Well, uh, a huge amount of gold shipped from Venezuela, for instance, mm -hmm. to uh, Iran, which is some of the ways that they get money despite the sanctions. But then they use this money to specifically finance terrorist organizations. So all in all, when we look at this, we can be quite certain that I Iran is posing a significant threat to the world. And that's why if tomorrow the, you know, Israel launches its ground attack on Gaza, uh, and it's able to rally support within the Arab world or the Muslim world as a whole, I should say, uh, then there is a chance of this becoming uh, much more complicated. One more little thing. Netanyahu, prime minister of Israel, calls Putin. What is this? So it's a good question. Uh, now, there's a very complicated issue they have with, with Russia, which is often talked about, namely the situation in Syria has been actually one of those major issues. Russia obviously exerts direct influence over the Assad regime in Syria. Uh, and so the only ability to negotiate with Assad's regime is via the Russians. So that's quite important for, for Israel. Second to that is the situation within uh, Iran itself. The partner, the eternal partner of Iran is Russia. And so this allows them to deal with the Russians who are, to be fair compared to the Iranians, more rational. Russia does not have a state policy of trying to eliminate Israel whereas the Iranians do have that as a state policy. So if they're trying to get the Iranians to not, you know, start launching ballistic missile attacks on Israel, 
It's definitely not the Americans that can help with that because the fact is we don't have diplomatic relations with Iran. Uh, we have no ability to influence that. Uh, whereas we can only influence it by offering to, you know, use force against Iran right, should that happen. Right, yeah. Whereas the Russians do actually speak to them. So there's, there's, it's, it's a really difficult situation because I would be the last person in the world to ever say speaking to Russia is going to be a good idea. In the case of Israel, they don't have a lot of other options given the fact that their neighbors are, are terrorist. And uh, not many people are going to deal with terrorists, but the Russians are happy to. Okay, well, um, Ukraine. Look at look at the world. Ukraine, Israel, Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Is there any way to cease the fire right now to prevent the global mayhem? So at this point, it's going to be very complicated. And I, I think really the most important question that lays at hand here is what happens in Gaza. Uh, if the Gaza invasion begins and it does cause a lot of civilian casualties, like we remember when there was just uh, last week the, the attack on the uh, hospital, which seems that it was a Hamas weapon that exploded, uh, but it was initially blamed on Israel. Within hours, there was you know tens and tens of thousands of people rallying and, and rioting in various Muslim capitals, uh, which is probably indicative of the fact that tensions are high already. If something else were to trigger another reaction like this, it would give those governments the Let's say the the moral obligation is how they would d define it, but it's all mm. fake. I mean, they they would just use this justification to need to then start attacking Israel as well. But it's just a justification. The fact is that these countries hate Israel and they wish to destroy it. But either, neither here nor there. I think if we look at what's going on in Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia, if we mm. look at what's going on in Kosovo and Serbia, if we look at all these different situations, this is undoubtedly the hand of Russia. Russia is the one that has the most to gain from this. And all the analysis that's come out in the United States so far about who has gained from Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel, uh, all analysis, especially those who are not Middle Eastern, uh, sorry, not Russia experts, but rather Middle Eastern experts, say that Russia is the clear beneficiary, the biggest winner of those attacks. Thank you very much, Mr. Smart. It was a pleasure. Again, hope to talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Goodbye. Watch this. Now, my next question is to artificial intelligence. Which of the superheroes could save the world today? The concept of superheroes saving the world is a popular theme in comics and movies, but in reality, no actual superheroes exist. In the real world, the task of addressing global challenges and saving the world falls on the shoulders of governments, international organizations, and dedicated individuals working in fields like science, technology, and diplomacy. While fictional superheroes can inspire and entertain, they cannot address real-world problems like climate change, poverty, and geopolitical conflicts. Therefore, the world relies on collaborative human efforts to tackle these complex issues. Watch this. More than six months ago, at the end of March, the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, suggested that China is building a new world order with itself at the very center. Well, who could ever think, right? In mid-October, Xi Jinping convened the One Belt, one Road International Summit, a few words about this one. This is a Chinese 10 years old initiative to develop transport infrastructure covering Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. The program envisages attracting more than $1 trillion of investments. However, in regards of Europe, only Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban visited China. Well, no surprise. We say Orban, we think Moscow. Bloomberg writes that the main reason why European leaders refused to go to the summit was Putin's presence there. Well, that could be a plus if someone from these leaders dared to arrest ICC as indicted Putin, but they did not for some reason. So Putin was invited as an honorary guest. At the forum, Putin was given the floor immediately after Xi Jinping. He praised the initiative and emphasized that it fits perfectly with the Russian Federation's goal of building a world with terror, oh, sorry for that, interconnected infrastructure in which fear, oh, sorry again, freedom of trade, investment and horror, sorry, labor can be fully ensured. The pub also adds that the Chinese leader has turned his initiative into sort of a club of developing economies, also known as the Global South. And it is exactly this alliance that can pose a challenge to the West. 
Xi Jinping did not mention the war in Ukraine or the Hamas attack on Israel in his speech, as usual for dictators. Ignoring facts is a way of ignorance. But he hinted at changes in global leadership. Like, you know, psst, the world is falling apart. Have you heard anything about that? Let's have a share. Xi Jinping noted that from China's point of view, these processes are positive. Sure they are. Cheap Russian president, oh, I'm terribly sorry for that, oil is good for China. Xi Jinping criticized unilateral sanctions, geopolitical rivalry in bloc politics, although he did not name no country. It was clear the remarks were referenced to United States policy on China in recent years. The humankind is a community with a shared future. China can only do well when the world is doing well. When China does well, the world will get even better. Viewing others' development as a threat or taking economic interdependence as a risk will not make one's own life better or speed up one's own development. Well, in response to China's projects, the European Union convened the Global Gateway Summit. It aims to expand its global infrastructure plan to compete with China in strategic regions. Brussels is more successful in attendance and hosts the leaders of 20 countries. Meanwhile, the world is waiting for the inevitable talks between Joe Biden and Xi Jinping. The leaders of the United States and China are to hold talks on the sidelines of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. The event will take place in San Francisco from November 11th to 17th. Now this ladies and gentlemen and other genders, is a thriller of the highest sort. In case you didn't know, APEC includes 21 member, including Russia. And Putin's appearance at the summit could end in his arrest. Not by order of the International Criminal Court, just by the way, because Washington does not recognize the jurisdiction of this court. However, United States State Department spokesman Matthew Miller said that there are other mechanisms for bringing the Kremlin leader to justice, but he did not specify which ones exactly. Maybe Washington made a deal with China, and Xi Jinping will arrest Putin for himself or Siberia in return, maybe for the favor? No. Russian Siberia is already Chinese. Now, what could that be? Xi Jinping knew Russian president, but well, why not? Russian seems to be not much into politics anyway. We'll see soon. I'm happy to give you our next guest, German political scientist, a analyst for the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, Andreas Umland is here. Watch this. As a person and as a professional, do you believe, Mr. Umland, that the world will ever see Putin, I know he's indicted by the International Criminal Court, but did you believe he would ever be arrested? That's difficult to say. Um, what I could imagine is that um, if Ukraine wins this war, that the regime will change. And then Putin would uh, perhaps lose his power. And what then happens to him is difficult to foresee. Um, I would rather not uh, believe in it. I hope for it, but um, maybe that's also not the most important uh, part of it. The, the fact that he's already indicted now for uh, this horrendous crime of child deportation is, I think, by itself already a, a big step forward. Indeed. He's, he's going to Xi Jinping, to his friend with no limits or whatever that means. Hmm. What the world should expect, what Ukraine should expect, I think the crucial question is here whether China is going to support uh, Russia economically and militarily in a significant way. If China decides to do so, and I'm not a, enough an expert on China to know uh, about this, then uh, Ukraine would indeed be in trouble. However, if these uh, meetings are all sort of sweet talk, as we 
as we know from China, Chinese leaders like yes, to do that. Exactly. They have always this this very sweet and uh, li friendship without boundaries. <laughs> and now the uh, the map of China was published, and um, it was a disclosure what what is meant without boundaries. Well, that was literally without boundaries. Uh, yes, yeah, without boundaries. So it has been told to yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, this yeah, is this yeah. is the so, way. So if if that all remains in in the rhetorical sphere and the uh, support is symbolic and or marginal then I think uh, it doesn't matter actually that much, um, whatever then C may say. But um, if we see here indeed um, a change of priorities in Beijing happening and then delivery of significant weaponry, right. that, that's going to be a, a real problem. What about Orban? Okay, Xi Jinping, I can understand. Putin wants, if not fr uh, friendship without boundaries, that some, some, uh, some help. But Orban. Yeah, Orban is bizarre, um, especially against the background that Hungary has its own history with the Tsarist Empire and also with Soviet Russia. So hundreds of thousands of Hungarians have suffered from, from Russian imperialism. Just by the way. Yeah, and, but, uh, you know, Lajos Kossuth or Imre Nagy, uh, the leaders of uh, this sort of independence movement in the 19th and 20th century, they're probably turning in their in their graves right now when this is all happening. Um, this is all very sad, actually. I still remember, I'm from East Germany, I remember the late 1980s uh, when, when Hungary was really the most forward-looking country, mm. when it was the most westernized country, and it was actually sort of breaking up the the old um, Iron Curtain right. and had a leading role, and now it's, it's suddenly fallen into this very strange role of... Uh, a supporter of Putin within mm. the EU and NATO. Do you think when, you, when, you, when you're saying it, you mean the whole country or whether we're talking about Orban? Yes, I'm, I guess it's mainly Orban and the people around him. I guess it's not the whole country, but unfortunately they rule the country and uh, Orban yeah, has right. a grip on right. the countries and Indeed. he's using uh, the weight of the country, the uh, relative weight that the country has in in NATO and in the EU to, to make all sorts of trouble and now also making some trouble even for countries like Sweden uh, with the accession of Sweden to NATO. This is all bizarre. Mm -hmm. What's to expect? I don't know. I think the, there should be much more um, pressure here from all sides, from, from the US, from the EU, from NATO to make, uh, to make Hungary behave. Otherwise, they, they, they should leave. I mean, but, but are they, why are they in these organizations if they act, uh, actively sabotaging its uh, both domestic affairs and, and foreign affairs? Well, they can keep on doing that because, I mean, Russia was presiding over the United Nations Security Council, as absurd as that. And, and, yes. and it, it's a disgrace for Europe. But the, can I ask you a question? Europe was always that impotent. In decisions. The World War One, Two. I mean, when when we, when the when the invaders, all kind of invaders, were invading, they were discussing it with 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 trying to somehow appease the yes the evil. It, yes, I agree that uh, there was in also in World War Two or before World War Two there was the Munich Agreement and. Um, all these things and the sort of sort of comical war after Poland was attacked by Hitler. And now again, we have this indecisiveness. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the, the European countries came together with the Americans mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and they did make then a move too late. Um, and here I hope this, this alliance that we are now seeing will, ho will hold actually. But even if we get... Um, to the best possible result, the, the odd thing about this entire war is that even if Ukraine uh, liberates all of its territories, including um, Crimea, and restores fully its borders, um, the West will, if that, that is all of the victory we, we, we're going to get, will, will be left in a weakened position. Because as you mentioned, the international organizations, the Security Council will be weakened, the um, uh, non-proliferation regime for uh, nuclear weapons will be weakened. It has now proven itself that the major uh, instrument that the West thought it had, economic sanctions, are actually a blunt sword oh, yeah. um, because the war has not been much uh, influenced so far by, by the 
um, uh, by the sanctions. Uh, the, the sanctions had some effect, but, but they have not really changed the course of the war. And we have these, all these remaining pro problems, the uh, reparation payments, the th apparently tens of thousands of deported children, um, the uh, p uh, prisoners of war, mm. um, international justice, all of this will remain even if Ukraine um, restores all, all of its borders. So this is something that we have to think already um, today and how we can achieve justice and some sort of punishment of Russia because otherwise um, the whole international order will be weakened by yeah, this. Yeah, crime in the punishment, you know, like a, yeah. the, the yeah. horse and the carriage. Yeah, yeah. yeah but the... Um, this, the, the, the whole situation in the world is a big revelation in, 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 in everything, like in security order, in, in, in organizations that should be maintaining security are not doing that, and maybe just, just expressing their deepest concerns while instead of making any actions, the second large army of the world that was considered some sort of a juggernaut is not that an Ukrainian army definitely proved that on the battlefield. What's next revelation? What do you believe is going to happen next? Well, maybe to, to, to add something to what you just said is what is also very odd in this, in this war since 24th of February to, uh, 2022 is that there are a lot of national interests that are touched, uh, of Western national interests of the Western countries, European countries that are violated in Ukraine. For instance, when Russia flies warheads over nuclear power plants or when it's bombarding <laughs> Kiev where we have these embassies, not only Western embassies, but also many other embassies. When Russia attacks the, the grain uh, storage and transportation system, which then leads to rise of prices for foodstuff on, on the world market, which then leads again to new uh, refugees, and these refugees go to, right. to the Europe, European Union and not the Eurasian Union. So we have here our own interests that are violated and we are not doing anything. We, and we have the, the weaponry, we have the technology to do something. We could actually um, create uh, no-fly zones over uh, nuclear power plants, but we don't, or over uh, embassies or over grain silos, uh, but we don't. Although it's about our interests, it's not, it's not just oh, yeah. uh, well, about... I mean, uh, um, about Ukraine. Yeah, what, what is going to happen is, is difficult to say. Um, the, um, now the election of a new speaker um, from the Trump camp um, in, uh, in Congress is, is, is troublesome. Uh, if the Americans are now um, becoming less reliant as partners, this is going to be very difficult. So if that will be for you to decide, Ms. Thelma, what would you do? Would you stop the situation from evolving or would you evolve it to some solution? Well, I would as a, let's say, as a, as a German, I would first of all say, we have to take care of our national interests on Ukraine's territory. We have to ask the Ukrainian government whether we can uh, protect all of the nuclear power plants on Ukraine's territory, yeah, just, whether we yeah. can protect our, our um, embassy, whether we can protect the grain transportation and grain sailors and so on. So that would be the first step, I think, to do, and not, you know, and, and that's the most important thing. And we and we would not even talk about Ukraine or Russia. We could even offer the Russians to put a no-fly zone over the Saporizhia power plant and see how they react, because we have an interest that the Saporizhia power plant, was, which is under Russian control, doesn't blow up. So let's put a, a, a no-fly zone over it. Yeah. So that would be, I think, the, the first step that has to be done. And for some reason, nobody is talking about it. And, and, and most Western uh, leaders have accepted that Ukraine is a, is a Russian underbelly. So well, you say. know, they're, they're even more, moreover, um, Mr. Rossi, that it should be in charge of the situation, said that he inspected the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and he saw some mines there but this is for security. Yeah. I mean, how weird, at least, is that? That the, for security, you plant a damn mine in the nuclear power plant. And the world is like, well, maybe, maybe that's the way. Yeah. Because I'm not, I'm not even telling that Putin is bad or good. I know that he's like... Uh, he is a terrorist and an international target large, but he's pushing forward what can be pushed. And the world is taking it, yeah. literally swallowing it. 
And of course, if, some, if something blows up there, or, but it's still, by the way, also about the Chernobyl power plant because there is the sarcophagus over the already destroyed reactor. Uh, maybe that's actually the most uh, dangerous uh, installation uh, because um, as far as I'm, I'm not an engineer, but as far as I understand... Well, um, you're, you're German. It, All Germans are engineers, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Um, as far as I understand the nuclear engineers, they say that these newer power, nuclear power plants are not as, as problematic as, as uh, Chernobyl uh, was and still, um, and still is. And then if, if something happens there and you then have a, new, um, a radioactive cloud and the wind, and, and the wind west blows west, what, right, what a, right. you know, this is our interest. It's not even about Ukraine or about Russia or about the war. It's just about our national security. For some reason, we make discounts here. We, we actually, we let ourselves being scared away from not only helping Ukraine, but also from protecting our own health, our own security, our own lives. And it's a bizarre bizarre situation. Well, let's and, speculate. Why is that? Yeah, I think it's just uh, fear. It's uh, in Germany. Fear of what? We call, fear of Russian? Is we, Germany yeah, fearing it's Russia? Angst. angst is the German yeah, word. Say, yeah. it's an, angst and it's Russland. the English. Yeah, we were just, we were, we we're just told by Putin that he's going to use weapons of, of mass destruction, then believe we believe in it. And I don't think they will, actually. The, I think what many people in the West also don't understand that these guys who make the decisions, they are either multimillionaires or billionaires. And they have a lot to lose. So they have very luxurious lives. They have large families who have also very luxurious lives. They will not, why would they do, I mean, they, they are the least people who, to start a, a, a nuclear war just for, you know, for, for territory. Why would they, uh, uh, you know, give, give away all, all of that? And so, but we nevertheless, we let ourselves be impressed by this uh, rhetoric and then, and we are ri risking our own, our own uh, interests Future. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Future of Europe, yeah. no less. And, and the world order, as you rightly said. If, if there is any order in, in, in this world. Well, the fact that China wants changes in the world is old news. And actually, there is nothing wrong with this, but what should these changes be looked like? So that they see both the West and East? How to... I will ask this question in, 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 in otherwise. China is a big power. How the world, what should the world offer it to be, um, I don't know, like, uh, like to offer it a place in the, in, 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 in the new world, in a brave new world, to become a partner of China, for us to become, is Europe and the civil, what the world calls itself civilized, somewhat civilized. What can we offer? Let's trade. Let's make China a friend a friend of Ukraine, a friend of Europe, a friend of civilized world. Maybe we should change the, the rhetoric. Maybe we should change the politicians. Maybe we should find, I don't know, another source of power in, in China, and not only Xi Jinping, because he's not the only one for sure. Um, it's a complicated issue. Oh, it's yes, also it is. the, I think China is something, is, is a country that, frankly, I don't understand uh, very well. I think we have to, to make our uh, priorities clear. We have to be in the communication clear. What we can remind China here also of is that China has actually supported the Budapest Memorandum in 1994. So the Budapest Memorandum was about the, um, uh, the agreement that uh, then was um, signed when Ukraine gave away its nuclear weapons. Mm. And uh, the original- Do you think that was a mistake? Um, that's difficult to say now. I mean, it, it looks like that to many Ukrainians now, but um, but I'm not sure something else was was possible then. Perhaps Ukraine could have then simply said, either we get into NATO, yeah. or we don't give a, give away our our weapons. So probably, that is a sort of a political blackmail. Yeah, but but I think the the uh, the West would have taken then. Yes, Ukraine, absolutely. Just, because, just because, because the, this the, is the language, obviously, that West understands way better than. Yeah, and, and the priority you know. back then was so high to get the nuclear weapons out of out of Ukraine. But the, the problem then is, of course, that you, uh, in Ukraine, in the Ukrainian population, there was no majority and no demand for NATO protection. Then this is the. So it's a sort of if, if, if. Back then. Uh, yeah, in 1994, right. they, this this large support for NATO accession only. 
uh, emerged after the annexation of Crimea. Unfortunately, there, there was. So, um, but, but uh, China was a part of this deal. It actually gave a separate governmental um, document to, to Ukraine where it also assured Ukraine of its respect for its borders. And it signed in 2013 um, uh, with Yanukovych back then a friendship treaty with Ukraine. And this friendship treaty was then um, ratified, um, I think, in Ukraine when Torshinov was president mm. and in, in China when, when Poroshenko was, was president. So, so China has, unlike Russia, uh, accepted the, the state continuity of, of Ukraine. Uh, because Russia says that basically the, the new Ukraine that emerged after the, um, um, the Euromaidan revolution is not any longer the old Ukraine. That's why it does not observe all the treaties it has with the, with the with the old Ukraine, but China has actually accepted the, the state uh, the state continuity, and of course this this Russian claim is absolutely absurd. So these are maybe the sort of things that one can today uh, refer to in in sort of building a relationship with China. Uh, one of the problems that Ukraine here has is that there's a lot of sympathy for the Ukrainian cause in Taiwan. And, you know, and then there is some sort of reciprocal um, yeah. um, sympathy from, from Ukraine, some sort of gr gratefulness, gratitude towards um, uh, Taiwan. And that is, of course, then a very, becomes a very touchy issue for Beijing. So what to do? I don't know. It's complicated. As I said, I, as long as, as China um, remains... I'm in... sorry for pushing you to the yeah, answer, yeah. because I don't know. I'm yeah. talking to experts. It's <laughs> yeah. my job, you know. Yeah. And experts are very... Uh, b b yeah. they, they talk a lot. Yeah. They are, um, but everyone says, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Yeah, it I've, seems like yeah. the world was completely not ready for... for, for you cannot be ready at a mayhem at, at that level but at least something. And I'm, that, that is what actually frightens me the most, that we don't have a plan. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the most obvious thing now to do is to support Ukraine as much as possible with, and with That sounds more, like a plan. Yeah, with more weapons and with different weapons, not just the ones we, we've so far provided. I hope that finally Germany comes around with these Taurus uh, um, uh, missiles. Uh, this is now after the, after the US has now, actually three countries have now, uh, Great Britain, France and the US have already provided this type of weaponry. So um, I think it's now time also for, for Germany uh, to go ahead. But um, yeah, but with China, I'm, I'm not sure what to do. Okay. I mean, th this is also, um, something that uh, is apparently changing now. What, the, what I hear is that China actually is, is facing a lot of problems, economic Indeed. and demographic problems. So maybe the China in five years will not uh, be any longer the China that we have uh, today in mind. Maybe, maybe that's another revelation. Maybe the dragon is not that big. And, and, yeah. and, and. But um, do you believe after, I like to think, inevitable victory of Ukraine? Do you think Russia has a chance of becoming something else, more democratic? I cannot say uh, for sure about Russia, but what we know for sure is that Germany had, uh, has done that, uh, admittedly under occupation, but also, you know, there was also a big impulse from inside Germany. Uh, it was, a, indeed, there was a... Um, of course, a very different situation in that uh, the capital was captured and then also Germany was divided. Maybe something like that awaits, uh, awaits Russia too, that it will perhaps not be captured and, and occupied, but it, that it will divide itself into, into uh, several parts. Um, but I think this, this war is actually going to be uh, crucial. I think that's also what I hear from many um, uh, Russian opposition uh, uh, leaders who say th this war is really, if, if Ukraine can achieve a victory, a full victory, at least on the battlefield and fully restore its territory, this is going to change Russia domestically. And what then comes out of it is very difficult to say, but um, I, I would still be somewhat uh, optimistic. Uh, but, then, um, but then again, there would be the, the question, what do you do then with all the, with the reparations, with the deported children? with the prisoners of war, with uh, international justice, with uh, war crimes and so on. That, so there would be a long, long list that this new Russia would be facing. 
again, somewhat similar to, to the situation of Germany after World War II. But the Germans did it, and, um, and they are now fully accepted, and they committed, uh, you know, more crimes, at least, you know, if you compare World War II to, to the right. war since 2014, then um, this is still a, a different a difference in magnitude. So that Russia has a chance, but um, but it has to do it from from inside, and from that within. is of course a very optimistic outlook. Let me ask you the final question of our lovely conversation. In terms of barbaric um, attack on Israel by Hamas, do you believe that the idea of proportionate answer is the right idea? Maybe the answer should be so in proportion. So to cause, so to stop it, finally. Oh, and where is the proportion? Where is the, that thin red line? Where it comes from and where it goes to? I would still make a decision, a, 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 a distinction here between, you know, a military answer and then perhaps an answer that would include uh, um, dis destruction of civilian uh, right. infrastructure. So the... The West and also the Soviet Union, they took in World War II the decision to actually bombard also just cities and, you know, like Dresden and so on. That was I th you know, in a way, you know, one can understand, and, and you, then you had Hiroshima, Nagasaki, these were all responses uh, to attacks. Um, and right. But I don't think that that is uh, today any any longer possible. And maybe disproportionate answer in terms of actually destroying military infrastructure. Then, then yes, uh, I, I would see no, lim uh, no limitations here. Um, but um, uh, but to, to have this sort of uh, large civilian ca casualties, sort of collateral damage, I don't think that is something that Ukraine should do. It's hard to be good, right? Yeah, I understand that many now also um, in Ukraine, they, they think in a, in a very rational way, actually, that the Russians will only st start uh, not supporting this war any longer if they have similar experiences. And so the sort of strategic revenge, if you like, which is sort of not a, not a revenge out of emotion, but actually out of strategy, where you say, well, if they don't understand it in another way... That's then, the language, yeah, that's, that's the, the yeah. tongue of war. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's becoming then a very morally, very diff difficult decision to make. Um, I guess that was the, the justification for Hiroshima and Nagasaki in, in 1945, Indeed. to actually scare the, the Japanese people to such a degree that well, they... Well, uh, the United just, States were, were scared uh, because of a Pearl Harbor, obviously. Yeah, they were attacked. Because that was a stupid uh, yeah, decision yeah. to, to yeah. put the, 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 the whole fleet into a narrow yeah. stretch. I mean, that was, well, that's something else. Yeah. But it was still, I would say, before the foundation of the UN, before the post-World post War II that is true. order. So I'm not sure this is, this is something that would still fly today. Maybe there is that thin red line that we all have to see the edge and no matter how hard is not pushing over it, maybe. But it is hard. It is easy for us to say in this very studio, but it is hard for my Israeli friends who lost and keep on losing territories and families and uh, money and, and lands constantly. So it is really hard issue and I have no answer on that. So this is why I was asking you. Yeah, I have, I have also no answer final just answer as well. Too. But anyway, das war unglaublich, Herr Omlund. Ich bedanke mich. Thank, Thank you, you so Thanks. very much for your conversation. It Thanks. was a pleasure. And my pleasure too, and honor. Watch this. First things first, the fact the global security architecture has successfully failed. This is what Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said last August about the conflict in the Balkans and the aggravation on the island of Taiwan. Remember that? Global security has not managed to secure anything, not only in Ukraine, but in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Israel. I would not like this list to be continued. But for this, the global world must act and act properly. Stop expressing deepest concerns and closing eyes, for example, to work out a concrete plan, military if necessary, and smite the face of dictatorships and autocracies in a truly international manner, no matter what color this face is. 
I think we can start at least with the consensus on reforming the UN Security Council. After all, its existence in its current form lost its meaning after the start of Russian aggression against Ukraine. Russia is a permanent member of the UN Security Council and abuses its veto power by blocking resolutions that are binding, absurd, insulting. The reform of the outdated body actually began to be discussed long before Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, however, there is still no option that would suit everyone has been found to this very day. In the war in Ukraine, world order is at stake, and the Ukrainian people are paying the ultimate price – their own lives. Vladimir Zelensky repeatedly emphasizes this across all global platforms. I heard it, personally. In particular, at the United Security Council in September in New York, the President of Ukraine once again emphasized that a system of preventive sanctions is needed in the event of threat of aggression. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has shown what can such a mechanism be. Among other things, powerful sanctions against the aggressor, not only at the stage when Bucha has already happened, but also at the stage of the build-up of the invasion army. Anyone who wants to start a war should see before their fatal mistake what exactly they will lose when they start a war. The issue of applying such preventive sanctions should be automatically submitted for consideration of the UN Security Council when any member of the UN General Assembly reports a threat of aggression. Our guest is already waiting for this very important issue to be discussed. We have a scientific fortune teller of a sort with us, Ihor Novikov, former advisor to the president of Ukraine. Hello, Ihor. Hi, hi. It's great to be here. Yeah, so uh, future is kind of terrible or terrific. Tell me about it. What do you think? Well, <laughs> well first of all, I have to specify I'm not a fortune teller. Um, what I study as a futurist, although I hate that term, right. is how t technology it affects human behavior, behavior at macro level, and therefore how the world is developing, uh, which is incredibly important even now. My job's become much easier now because it, you can now see the change with the uh, naked eye, and the spirit of turbulence obviously is affecting everyone. So, uh, so, so, so yeah, no, I'm not a fortune teller. I'm an academic. Oh yes, That's you are. Very... <laughs> oh yes, you are. You are a scientific fortune teller. Yeah. Okay. So now you agree with me. It was easy. Is it that easy to persuade this? Yeah, I mean, all right, well, let, me, let, let us pass to my other question. If that would be for you to decide, yeah, how would you change the world order in the nearest future to make the future look better? Well, that's one of the biggest debates in the, uh, you know, in the, in the innovation, within the innovation community, because mm. um, there are two extreme potential outcomes of this change, of this period of change. One uh, is called uh, the world of abundance, therefore the world mm -hmm. where we use technology available to us to make everyone's lives better and to kind of to promote democracy, liberty, freedom, everything. And the other one is the um, anti-utopian scenario where uh, basically you have uh, digital dictatorships basically all over the world. And the road to that scenario is very painful and very bad. One thing I can tell you, um, in my personal opinion, I think we're going to see the glimpse of what the future 50 years look like mm. um, after the presidential election in the United States next year. Yeah, everything. Everything depends on the presidential elections in the United States. Have you noticed? I have, I have mm. noticed. But Why is know, that, I wonder? So it's pretty obvious. I mean, if uh, if you build a world where we have the uh, so-called world policemen, you know, um, we kind of depend on the uh, decisions that the American people make within their democracy. But hmm. once that and the world order is challenged, and it is being challenged as we speak, we sure. can see certain um, certain partnerships develop. Um, basically, then you know, it's even more important what the U.S. does to counter that or to accept that. And that depends on the outcome of the election. Yeah, well, um, more or less clear with the United States, more or less clear with, with the future of the United States. What about Ukraine? What role Ukraine plays in the formation of a new world's order, whatever it means, whatever that will be? 
Well, that role, I mean, uh, do you want the uh, do, you, do you want me to tell you what you want to hear, or do you want the truth? That's no, very tell me, tell me anything me, you like. I mean, tell me what I hate to hear. You. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah, because, you know, the future isn't as bright as people think. And unfortunately, we have to be realistic about it. Now, Ukraine's role in that is being determined, obviously, on the battle on the battlefield at the moment. But more importantly, one phenomenon that has been emerging for over the last 10 years, and that's become crucial to um, to even like destinies of nations and countries is uh, the so-called information society. So everything is about storytelling now, everything is about attention, everything is about information. And um, unfortunately, Ukraine's role will depend on how, not only on how we hopefully win this war, but how we tell the story. Because if we're forgotten, we're gonna be left alone facing you know, the, the evil up north. So, and not only up north. I mean, there is a certain axis of evil being formed right now. Right, right. Well, maybe then the ways should be changed. Maybe new ways should be created. Maybe the new international platform should be created for those like Ukraine in the center of creation of that platform. And that platform will be describing what is going on and why Ukraine wants to have uh, um, an epicenter position in all that. Maybe the idea of that platform is a good idea. Just asking. Uh, well, the idea of such a platform is a good idea, but once again, let me bring you back to what I just told you. Right. It's all about people. It's all about people's attention. If you look, for example, at Slovakia at the moment, I mean, they've elected a pro-Russian prime minister now, who uh, basically is denying Ukraine any military help, and that country is, you know, in the heart of Europe. Uh, if you look at the uh, American domestic politics, you're seeing similar phenomenon where populism and even certain degrees of uh, foreign intervention by you know propaganda and populism and foreign agents within the country is taking its toll and you know unfortunately democracies are really badly protected against that so before we think about any platform we need to solve the underlying problem because you know regardless of what platform you build you're going to have your Orban or you're going to have, uh, you know, whatever that guy's name is in Slovakia. You're going to have your Trump or Giuliani or somebody else who's just going to destroy uh, that institution from within. And therefore, you know, we can we can kind of put those band-aids all over the place. But until we kind of cure the actual disease, until we actually figure out, find that new stability, unfortunately, any attempt at building new platforms or even new world order is going to fail. Ultimately. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. But maybe you, uh, we have to take the instability as a new stability. Maybe we will have to understand that the stability and order is not the best. Maybe some sort of a, uh, being ready for the world to a next mayhem. Maybe the United Nations Security Council that is ready to react on an international thug presiding over it would be the new idea of the whole thing. Maybe the how fast the international organizations react to something. The Security Council securing actually anything. Maybe this is the thing. Well, well I can uh, let me begin by telling you what I usually tell my students at Singularity. So um, the new reality means that, do you remember how our parents used to tell us you have to stand firmly on your own two feet? Now, standing still on a, on a treadmill is a recipe for disaster. So I think the kind of accepting that instability and being adaptive to it mm, is exactly. at the core of Darwinism. Right, it's at right. the core of evolution and surviving. Yeah. And also, we instead of standing firmly on our own two feet, as our parents told us, we need to learn to ride the bike. So that that's kind of point number one. But in terms of UN Security Council, I mean, I'm sorry to disappoint, but that's an organization that uh, appeared on the world map you know, nearly 100 years ago, 80 years ago. Well, I thought you, you would uh, just tell me like it, it was a big bang and before that was the United Nations Security Council. No, 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 no. no. United Nations Security Council ha was formed for the uh, post-Second World War reality. It served its purpose. But, you know, we're living in, in a completely different reality and therefore kind of relying on old institutions is useless. I mean, they're not going to do anything. It's not about how quickly they react. If you have uh, the aggressor country 
sitting there at the table, spreading lies and propaganda and having veto power, what's the point in that useless organization? Well, I mean, so look at, look at, it, Ihor, yeah, yes, I mean, the, look at the questions they're asking. We don't have mechanisms to make, um, to, 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 to not, for, for that not to happen. What kind of a mechanism do you really need to stand up and walk away? What kind of a mechanism is that? Well, to be honest, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, um, you know, this probably slightly entropic in its nature, but this move towards decentralization of everything. Right. Uh, okay. I'd, I'd prefer to have strong alliances with the United States, the United Kingdom, and, you know, certain states in Europe and in Asia. Uh, I'd prefer, I'd take that over any, like, global multinational institution that's supposed to uh, prevent evil from happening. So I take that, I take that decentralized bilateral approach over any f more complex right. forms of uh, institutions because they simply don't work. I mean, like democracy is being challenged now. So any institution that has uh, the need for a unanimous decision or veto power, and mm -hmm. that involves more than two countries, is right. sooner or later so going to be affected by populism. And I thank you so very much for you being curious and very scientific about that. I just love to hear that. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Pleasure was all mine. Thank you. Watch this. A new world and a new order. These two things are to emerge very soon. What will they look like? We don't know, but we're definitely going to find it out for you, our beloved audience. It was me, Henry Keane, and my show. Talk for more. Find us on the internet. Like, comment, and subscribe. Your opinion matters the most to us. Stay safe and tune for more. Thank you very much. See you soon.